The purpose of this discussion is to uh, look at the Marxist analysis of imperialism, what it is, how it developed. Now, of course, imperialism involves the building of empires, um, and in that sense, the phenomenon is very old. It goes back to the ancient world, um, the Roman Empire and other uh, such empires. Um, but they were not of the kind that we're going to discuss today and analyze today. They're not of the kind that Lenin analyzed in his book on imperialism. The Roman Empire was a, a constant conquest of new territories and new peoples, grabbing slaves. The economic system was based on slavery. You could say that a lot of the wars the Romans fought were massive um, raidings to, to, to grab as many slaves as possible to keep the system going. Um, but today, we don't have that. And yet, we do have the phenomenon of imperialism. Um, before today's form of, of, let's say, capitalist-type imperialism, we also had physical occupation of territories. The rise of capitalism in its early days eventually led to the colonization of other parts of the world. Um, but practically, the whole of Africa was colonized. Um, North and South America uh, were colonized. Large parts of Asia were colonized. I literally occupying these countries, taking them over, and exploiting them to the benefit of the imperialist power that was occupying. Um, with this came uh, the export of capital. In Britain, you all do at school, you know, the East India Company, how it was set up, and what it eventually became, um, a tool to uh, colonize the Indias, um, India, the, the Indian subcontinent. Um, since then, of course, We've had a shift from direct military occupation because of the, uh, the, the, the risings of the people, peoples that lived in these countries, direct military presence, direct colonization was removed and these countries became um, independent. Independent at least in, the, in terms of they elected, the, well, didn't always elect their own governments. A lot of them were dictatorships, but they run, in a certain sense, you could say they governed themselves. There was no longer direct rule from uh, Britain or France or whichever was the imperial power at the time. And yet, we can say that decades after the colonial revolutions which brought down the old empires, the British, the French, etc., these countries are still dominated by the same powers um, through the economy. Today, earlier on, uh, a comrade in discussing Ireland quoted Connolly when he said that if you, you, know, you raise the green flag above Dublin, uh, unless you proceed to a, a socialist, to a workers' republic, then they will still govern you through the banks and the finance system. And that is the case today of a large part of the world. It's still dominated by um, the multinational corporations, by the banks, by the finance system. But there's also a military element, although it's not a direct military occupation. Just consider the fact that the United States of America does have an empire. It doesn't have a British empire. It doesn't have a viceroy. It doesn't have um, the direct administration of colonies, although it's got one or two small ones. But it has a military presence in nearly, nearly 800 military bases in 70 countries around the world. It has a huge military presence around the world. And they're there, not as a direct occupier, but to make sure things run according to the interests of the capitalist class that they defend. Now, if we want to look at Lenin um, and look at his, the, the essence of the, the kind of imperialism he was, he was dealing with, or trying to analyze, was the phenomenon of imperialism as it emerged on the basis of capitalist development, not the old ancient um, empires. Um, what we had in the early days of capitalist development, you had the emerging capitalist class um, becoming a class uh, that possessed the means of production, that invested in, in industry and production. But out of industrial capital, you have the emergence of finance capital. Once you have accumulation beyond a certain level, 
you actually have the beginnings of a division within the capitalist class itself. The industrialists, let's say, who invest the money and produce goods and sell them, and the finance capital, which simply provides a huge amount of capital to the industrialists for a cost, of course. Interest, uh, that's how the banks work, how that's how finance capital works. Um, this uh, uh, led the emerging capitalist countries, like Britain, uh, Holland before, the French and others, to move around the world to directly occupy um, uh, uh, much less developed countries in most cases. Um, literally, you could say it was land annexation, taking over territory and take it, uh, controlling it. That, that was there in the Roman Empire. They just took over territory and ran it. Um, but here, there's a different element to it, which is this financial aspect. And for example, Argentina is historically considered an ex-colony of Spain, like most of the Spanish countries, except for Brazil, which was a Portuguese um, colony. Um, but if you look already at the beginning of the 20th century, you look at Argentina, you see that it was massively dominated by British capitalism. Not direct military intervention, but um, massive loans and investments in Argentina on the part of both British and German um, capital. And there was a, an imperialist domination of Argentina by the British, who had never colonized Argentina directly, but dominated it because they were, compared to Spain, which was a much less developed country from a capitalist point of view, its colonies ended up being dominated by Britain, by Germany, by the United States, i.e. far more advanced capitalist countries that come in and with the weight of the, of the capital they, they possess, they can start to take control of these countries. You also have different types of imperialist powers. You have the British, the French. Today you have the United States. Um, there was a period in which the United States were a colony of Britain. And here we have an example of what was formerly a colony becoming the most powerful imperialist power that the world has ever seen. Or a Germany, which when Britain was rising as an imperialist power, was a country that was divided into many statelets and emerged eventually as a powerful capitalist power much later, the same with Japan. Or you have a, a Russian type of imperialism, which at the same time as being an imperialist country, which is what it was at the time of the Russian Revolution, they had an empire, the Tsarist Empire, which had a lot of similarities to the old, old empires in the sense that it was, rather than a world spread through its financial power, it was literally the occupation of territories bordering um, Russia, and at the same time, a semi-colony. It was an imperialist power, but dominated by the more powerful imperialist countries, which is part, an essential part of, the, of Trotsky's analysis of the permanent revolution. At a certain point, the world became totally divided um, with, between diff the different powers. Every part of the non-capitalist world, let's say the non-developed part of the world, was literally di directly occupied or dominated by imperialist powers. Um, and the question that uh, Lenin uh, uh, touches on in, in his book is, once the world is divided, can it be redivided? Can new imperialist powers emerge on the basis of um, a world which is, which is already divided between the existing powers? And he makes the point that it can happen, and it does happen. Um, he refers, for instance, to the rise of Japan and as, an, as an imperialist power um, in the East, uh, which starts to encroach on the interests of the established imperialist powers. Um, we have the phenomenon of Im imperialist powers which enter into decline. That was the case of the British, um, a long-term decline, where eventually they lost their empires completely. But it wasn't just the, the loss of territory, it was the loss of influence over the colonies. And in the same period as you have the, rise of Briti the, 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 the decline of British imperialism, you have the rise of US imperialism, a former colony which transforms itself into an imperialist power, far more powerful than the, Brit than the British um, imperialists ever were. Um, so you have declining powers and a redivision of the domination um, of, um, of the world. There was a moment in which... Uh, within the left, uh, Kautsky was an exponent of this idea. You had the idea of super-imperialism, i.e. that 
um, the logic of the situation was that the major imperialist powers would eventually coalesce into one super imperialist power. And the logic of that, of course, was that once that's established, we will have peace in the world because there'll be no interests to go to war between the different uh, powers. Lenin ridiculed this, uh, this theory and uh, what happened in the 20th century, I think, confirms what he said. The First and the Second World War put an end to that idea that you could have such a thing as super imperialism, i.e. a kind of world imperialist administration of, of, the, of the rest of the world um, and where they sort of peacefully negotiate amongst themselves and they defend their interests in a common way. We're seeing that today is not the case. Um, now, um, since Lenin's day... A hundred years have passed since he wrote his book on imperialism. We have um, uh, this process of redivision of, of, of falling powers and rising powers uh, happening again. We saw first the rise of American imperialism parallel to the decline of British. Since the Second World War, we have seen American imperialism going to a relative decline. Um, if you look at its weight in the economy, for example, the power of American imperialism was based on, one, from the end of the 19th century, more or less the 1890s, through to the 1950s, a development of productivity on an um, uh, unprecedented scale within the American economy. Massive growth of the productive forces of the United States, outcompeting the rest of the world, and it was on that basis that America became the power that it became. Um, when at the end of the Second World War, more than 50% of world GDP was produced within the borders of the United States. Now consider that. The United States population as a percentage of the world population in 1945 was 6%. That 6% of the world population was producing more than 50% of world GDP. That's where the power of American imperialism um, lies. And it was based on massive investment and the growth of the first half of the 20th, uh, 20th century. Since then, American imperialism, it remains the major power on a world level, but it's not the power of 1945, which, which is all dominating. It has gradually lost um, uh, the power it had. Now, depends on the figures you look at, between 15 and 20% of world GDP is made in the United States. Still a very large part for one country, but no longer the weight and the power that it had. And um, in attempting to maintain that position, um, we have contradictions on a world scale. One, in order to maintain the, the military spending that the United States um, has, it has to squeeze its own population. Hillary Clinton a few years ago said, we are not going to give up on our military uh, power. Well, a declining power, a relatively declining power to maintain the same military force that it had in the past has to do it at the expense of somebody. And one, of the pe one section of the world population that suffers is the American working class. And with that comes political uh, conclusions. It's within the context of this historical decline of U.S. imperialism that you can understand the Sanders phenomenon appearing in the United States. You can understand the opinion polls which show that the majority of the youth in America say they would vote for a socialist candidate as president of the United States. Not so long ago, that was not the case um, in America. The growing radicalization and the instability inside the United States is a reflection of its historical decline. And if you want to have a parallel, in Britain, in the period of its decline, you had the emergence of the Labour Party, an independent party of the British working class, the, the rise of the trade unions, and then you had the general strike in the 1920s. That was a product of the weakening of British imperialism and the effects it had internally. But the weakening of US imperialism on the global scale has an effect, and it explains actually to a great degree, what we're actually seeing around us today in the world. For example, there was a time when the world was dominated by two superpowers. That was the United States and the Soviet Union. They had their spheres of influence, 
One didn't touch the other. Eastern Europe, they agreed, belonged to uh, Stalinist Russia. They had influence in other parts of the world. America had um, its sphere of influence. We discussed the question this morning in one of the sessions about um, Islamic fundamentalism and the situation in the Middle East. Now, for example, Egypt at one point um, was gravitating towards the Soviet Union under Nasser. And if they had wanted to, Egypt could have gone, could, could have ended up in, under the sphere of influence of the Soviet Union. But the Soviet Union, this is a, a separate discussion, but the nature of the bureaucracy meant that it didn't want to spread its system. They just wanted to defend their own position, their own privileges. Therefore, they pushed NASA back from moving too far. They did that several times. In areas which were considered sphere of influence of US and European imperialism, the Russians don't step in. And equally, when the tanks go into Hungary or into Czechoslovakia, the West don't step in. They, they, they had a kind of stable setup. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, on the one hand, you had America emerging as the only superpower on the planet. But within that, there was the other process which I described, which was going on and had been going on for decades, a weakening of US imperialism. So um, the two policemen uh, that we had before became one. The one policeman under Bush, if you remember, they thought this was it. We have now, we are, we, we are dominant. We can do whatever we want. Um, he went into Iraq, Afghanistan, thinking they could just behave like they always did. But look at the consequences of their intervention in the Middle East. Instead of having a Middle East with regional powers which obey uh, U.S. imperialism, the Turks, the Saudis, and the others, what we have is a situation of a declining world power, and you can see that more than anything else in Syria, where... Uh, the influence of the U.S. is far uh, less than it would have been in the past. The fact that the Russians have a conference with Iran and Turkey and discuss how they're going to solve the Syrian question and don't invite the U.S. or, or, or the U.N. shows you the changing balance of forces that exist um, around the world. What we have is the decline of the major imperialist power, the United States, not able to flex its muscles like it used to, and that explains also the behavior of smaller powers. Now, there is a discussion on the left um, about the nature of imperialism, what is an imperialist power, can Turkey be imperialist, for example? Can, um, uh, can some of these other countries be imperialist? Can Iran have imperialist aspirations? We would say, yes, they do. Iran, for example, um, has a huge influence inside Iraq using the Shia um, uh, element of, uh, of Iraq um, the Saudis are in conflict obviously with, with Iran as, as a power they try to promote their interests in, in the Middle East with the backing of, of these Islamic fundamentalists they've come off worse of course but they had their own aspirations which were going against the interests of US imperialism in the region the Turks again in the past would have been more in line with um, the, 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 the position the United States was pushing instead We've seen them behaving more independently in, in the Middle East. They attended the conference with the Russians um, and discussed with them. The Russians are using the Turks, of course, as a, as a minor power to, to, to push their own agenda in the region. So you have the phenomenon of minor imperialist powers within this context. And when you have a situation of a breakdown in the world order which had existed for several decades and the weakening of the big policemen, then a, a whole series of contradictions appear in different areas with different powers coming into conflict um, with, um, with, uh, with each other. Now, um, if you haven't read it, I would advise comrades to read and study Lenin's imperialism because he's tackling, he's coming to terms, he, he, he's, he, he's tackling this phenomenon of what is it. And uh, I haven't got time, obviously, to read the whole book to you. It's not that long, um, and it is a very interesting book. Um, he talks about it being the highest stage of capitalism. Some people call it the final stage, but there's no such thing as the final stage of capitalism until you overthrow it. Then you, can, then you can declare the final stage was the one before its overthrow. But until it's overthrown, it's going to have several stages that it keeps on living in spite of um, that, that idea. But the highest stage in the sense of capitalism emerges within, within individual countries. And as it develops the productive forces, it requires bigger markets Eventually, capitalist powers emerge, investing globally 
Marx describes the process in the Communist Manifesto where he says that capital basically chases all around the world and it brings within its sphere the whole, the whole world, the whole planet. Um, it, there's not a corner of the world today which is not part of the capitalist system. The predictions of Marx have been proved brilliantly and Lenin uh, based himself on that. Um, he looks into the rise of the banks, the concentration of capital. Um, he looks at what he calls old capitalism, um, when free competition held undivided sway. These are the words of Lenin. Um, he says, typical of the old capitalism was the export of goods. He says, typical of the latest stage of capitalism, when monopolies rule, ma major corporations, is the export of capital, where they start to use their capital to invest around the world. One form of that is lending uh, money. The way they dominated Argentina and Brazil um, was through the lending of money to, for investment. Very often you'd have Argentine companies and on the board of directors would sit an English banker or an, Eng uh, an English uh, capitalist who would be there to make sure the company was operating according to the interests of the imperialists. And the power they had, what gave them the power to do that was the huge capital they had and they, they had accumulated. Um, now, the export of capital, of course, has an effect. It changes the world. It doesn't stay as it was. It doesn't remain a world of extremely backward, underdeveloped countries and advanced capitalist countries. The export of capital exports the capitalist system with it. Um, you end up, uh, first of all, in the initial stages, you are there uh, to grab the minerals, mining, resources, etc., but gradually, they start to invest in industry. And you start, you start to see capitalist companies developing where formerly they didn't exist. One of the elements, again, of, of Trotsky's theory of the permanent revolution is that in Russia, capitalism did not emerge like it did in the uh, Dutch Republic or um, under Cromwell, in, in Cromwell's period. Um, it emerged through the investment of capital by the advanced capitalist countries, French, British, Americans, German, they would, they would go to Russia, invest, and you're not going to build a little tailor shop in Russia. You build a modern factory with thousands of workers in that factory, and basically you establish modern capitalist relations within a sea of backwardness. And you start to, you see the emergence of a, of a modern uh, proletariat in, in, um, in Russia, which is what led then to the revolution, determine the nature of that revolution. Um, but um, we have, for instance, the recent phenomenon of the last 30 years, um, this massive investment of foreign companies in China. Um, and they weren't just exporting capital in the sense of lending money. 450 of the 500 top world uh, corporations have plants, have factories in China. Um, and why did they go there? Well, first of all, obviously, the, 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 the bureaucracy in China invited them to invest in order to, to, to accelerate the development of China. And they provided them with um, good conditions. They created the, the, the special zones. Part of this is the facility to repatriate your profits. Another element was the extremely cheap Chinese labor. Capital runs around the world looking for sources of good investments. Where can we invest and get the maximum returns. And China is an example of that, where because of the cheapness of the cost of labor, you turn up with, with your capital, with the latest modern technology, you build a modern factory in China, equally competitive to the, to the factories in Germany or the United States, but with the added advantage that the workers that you employ are on um, very low wages compared to what you, would, you have to pay an American or a European worker. There's an, uh, some, some other added advantages. It's not, you're not allowed to go on strike in China. Um, there is um, uh, a, a, a regime which is a totalitarian regime which doesn't allow for that. Um, so when you see, uh, there's a lot of talk these days, this is an, an, an aside, about the Chinese, the, the, the Congress taking place in Xi, uh, Xi's speech. Some people are saying, ah, oh, see it, we're going back, but we're going back to socialism, you know. Um, the, the, and the other side of that is that the bourgeois complain that in China they're not reforming enough. What they mean is they're not having bourgeois democracy. As if, as if, to have a capitalist development you must have a bourgeois democracy. Now, 
I'm a bit older than some of you, and I remember that capitalism survived under Pinochet. It survived under the military dictatorship of Argentina. And further back, it survived under Hitler, and it survived under Mussolini and under Franco. They didn't need democracies to run capitalism in, in, in those countries. In fact, they needed a dictatorship to crush the working class, which had dared to rise up. So the advantages in a lot of these countries are, were, in fact, that um, you had a, a young working class, almost non-existent working class. They were peasants coming into the factories with no traditions, prepared to work on very low um, uh, wages, and therefore easily exploitable from a capitalist point um, of view. That is going on all the time. Funnily enough, China is now being told that the workers are pricing themselves out of jobs because, in spite of everything, they have struggled and they have pushed up the cost of labor in China. Then they shifted to Vietnam because Vietnam was providing cheap. I saw a map recently of countries they're looking at to invest in, which include places like Ethiopia um, and other parts of the world which um, were very uh, underdeveloped up until recently, Capital shifts constantly in order to get the best returns. The good thing, the good side of this uh, is that in the process, they strengthen the working class. They build factories, and factories, whether Tony Blair talks to you or not, is not, are not filled by bourgeois. They're filled by workers, um, workers who um, are there to produce the goods the capitalists want them um, to produce. And with it comes organization, comes trade unions, and eventually also a political voice. And, and going back to what Marx says, capitalism uh, creates its own grave diggers. And we can see that happening in front of us in China, where at the same time as this massive investment has taken place, they've created, numerically speaking, the biggest working class in the world. And that means they've created, they've strengthened the working class um, internationally. Now, to go back to, um, um, uh, to Lenin, um, he, he sees the world at the beginning of the 20th century as a world divided by different powers. They'd taken, they'd basically domin they'd taken control of different parts of the world, and the world was completely uh, divided up. Um, but he referred to, the, uh, to this concept of the redivision as a result of uneven uh, development. He says, the division of the world between two powerful trusts does not preclu preclude redivision if the relationship of forces changes as a result of uneven development, war, bankruptcy, etc. I.e., the changing fortunes of different capitalist powers um, can lead to a redivision of the world um, between different powers. And this is actually what we've been seeing in the last 30, 40 years. With the, first, we have the decline of the European powers, that in order to survive on a global scale had to come together. That's, that's what the European Union essentially is. Um, and of course, they do collectively uh, exploit um, the former colonial countries, but they are powers which all have relatively declined compared to 100, 150 years ago. The rise of America and then the gradual decline of America and the emergence of um, other uh, powers. Um, he says, the words of Lenin, the capitalists divide the world in order to obtain profits. They divide it in proportion to capital, in proportion to strength, um, because there cannot be any other method of division under commodity production and capital, capitalism. But strength varies with the degree of economic and political development. So depending on the development of the individual powers, their ability to dominate the rest of the world also changes. He does refer, I haven't got kind of here, to the fact that once you reach a stage where the division of influence and power can no longer be determined by the terms of trade in economic terms, then the, the bourgeois moves to another method of redivision, which is war. And the First and the Second World Wars were actually the concluding, uh, you could say, act of imperialism in the sense that once they divided the world uh, uh, globally, and as each power developed, and as different powers emerged, such as Germany becoming a, an industrial powerhouse in the heart of Europe, but because it came late on the scene uh, um, of history, the world was already more or less divided by the, the British, the French, and other, and other imperialist powers. At a certain point, in order to determine who was to dominate the world market, 
the First World War came. Now, in, the, in, in schools, they tell you it was because of what happened in Serbia. Uh, and, of course, that is just a fairy tale. I mean, it did happen, but that's not the cause of the war. All the conditions for that war had been accumulating prior to that. And the Second World War is often referred to as basically the continuation of the First. I've heard some historians who talk about the 30-year war, started in 1914 and finished in 1945. There's an element of truth in that in the sense that it was a conflict between the powers. And if you see what happens at the end of that 30-year period, Britain emerges as a much weaker power, France also, and America emerges as the major power. That was, the, that was what was decided fundamentally by the Second World War. And of course, another an aside, of course, is the emergence of a powerful Soviet Union. Um, um, he, he also, Lenin also looks at the question of young, young powers, he calls them, growing in an extraord, extraordinarily rapid uh, manner. He looks at uh, the USA, he looks at Japan, and he actually looks at the vigor, the life of these imperialist powers, and compared to the old powers, the senility of British imperialism, for instance, unable to develop at the same rate. He, he looks at that, he says, and I'll quote him, he said, um, young capitalist countries, and he says, America, Germany, Japan, whose progress has been extraordinarily rapid. Then he says, secondly, countries with an old capitalist development, France and Great Britain, whose progress lately has been much slower than that of the previously mentioned countries. And thirdly, a country most backward economically, Russia, where modern capitalist imperialism is enmeshed, so to speak, in the particularly close network of pre-capitalist relations. So he's looking also at different imperialist powers, different degrees of development, and also, in a certain sense, different types of imperialism, because Russia was uh, still semi-feudal. Um, he also looks at imperialist powers which maintain their power thanks to a bigger power. And he refers, for instance, to Portugal. Portugal had all its colonies. But Portugal was a classic country because of its uh, uh, backward nature. In effect, was dominated by British capital and British imperialism economically and very often was used um, around the world for the interests of British uh, imperialism. And um, he, he looks at that, these smaller imperialist powers that can operate locally to defend their interests on the basis also of sometimes the conflict between the major imperialist powers, which leaves them a niche to, um, to operate. Um, he says, he, he refer, he, in one quote, he says, that the more capitalism, capitalism is developed, the more strongly the shortage of raw materials is felt, the more intense the competition and the hunt for sources of raw materials throughout the whole world. Well, let's look at China and its investments in Africa. It's Silk Road, which is not just a road. It's the sea and it's the roads... Um, it's, it's, a, it's a transport network which links up something like 3 billion people on the planet, almost half the globe. Um, the investments in Africa, where in return the Chinese get the raw materials, they get the oil. Um, there you see this quest for raw materials because of the economic development of China, the industrial development of China. Um, and that is leading to conflicts. With it comes China, for instance, investing militarily. It's still nowhere near the United States. The United States has a contradiction. Britain has the same. A much bigger military apparatus than it could really afford to maintain on the basis of its economic uh, position. Britain still maintains um, Trident missiles, which I don't know who they're aimed at, um, who they would hit. Is it Denmark or Germany or Poland? I don't know. But they maintain it as a kind of, um, uh, as, uh, th their argument is that it, it's a deterrent. Um, it consumes a huge amount of resources for a country which, economically speaking, really isn't up to that level. Um, but China, on the other hand, hasn't got the military power there of America, but it is building it up. Um, aircraft carriers, for example, um, they've got their second, I think. They're investing... They're planning to have a series of aircraft carriers over the next 10 years. Now, what are aircraft carriers for? They're to use where you can't have a military base, where you can't have a, an airport to take off from. Um, it means long distance. It means sea lanes. It means defending China's interests on a global scope towards the Middle East, in the South China Sea, etc. And with it comes investment in, um, in the military. 
And it's, uh, it still has a long way to go, but we see the direction that it's going in. Um, now, uh, I've, I've seen groups on the left who take Lenin, not just on imperialism, but almost any question. We, I, I've seen it happen uh, in other meetings that we've had here. It's usually, it's usually the characteristic of a sectarian who uh, refuses to think, refuses to use Marxism as a method of understanding reality we are in, rather than a Bible which tells you how it should be, was, is, and always will be. And they will take something from Lenin and say, Lenin said this, therefore this is it. This is how it's, it is to be. Um, this is how Lenin, he gives a word of warning, and I think we should take that on board. Um, he says, um, be, be, first he says, the briefest possible definition of imperialism, we should have... Uh, to say that imperialism is the monopoly stage of capitalism, i.e. the emergence of major corporations on a global scale. But then he says, without forgetting, uh, and so without forgetting the conditional and relative value of all definitions in general, this is Lenin, which can never embrace all the concatenations of a phenomenon in its full development, we must give a definition of imperialism. So he gives his definition, but he also says, you know, um, that um, you can't expect a definition to explain everything. And also, if you read Lenin, you see that his analysis flows from a study of a process of change that took place under capitalism from its early days to the stage of monopoly um, capitalism. Um, so he leaves open other possibilities. He actually says that even in the period of crisis, you can have corporations which are doing rather well. Within a general crisis of the system, you, you can have certain countries which are developing and moving forward, which doesn't deny the overall analysis of a world in crisis. Think about it. This is Lenin. If you try and use it today, you'd say, well, there is a world crisis of capitalism. China is affected. But for the last 20 years, within a period in which you see the crisis of the European Union, the decline of the United States, you have the emergence of China which is developing, and developing um, industry, uh, the economy, um, and moving forward, of course, that in turn then pre prepares new contradictions, because the problem you have on a global scale is when you have competing imperial, imperial powers, you have growing instability, especially when there's not one big bully. You know, on the playground, there are, yeah, I remember you'd have the big bully, and nobody dared challenge the big bully, and then the little bullies would all sort of group around the big bully and everybody else were victims. If the big bully wasn't around, then the other ones, who's the boss? You ended up with a bigger fight than you had normally because normally the big one would keep them all under control. There's an element, you can, I mean, I'm, I am oversimplifying world economics and politics. <laughs> um, but um, the point I'm trying to make is the decline of one major power brings out all the contradictions which we are seeing. And in effect, we are seeing what Lenin referred to um, he says at a certain point, the fact that the world is already partitioned obliges those contemplating a redivision to reach out for every kind of territory. And he, he explains that um, uh, later in the book that the fact that the world is divided doesn't mean it, can, it can't be redivided. It doesn't mean that one power can take the influence away from another. And for example, if what happened to Germany after the First World War, it lost its colonies. In, uh, in Africa. Who were they taken over by? The French and the British. Southwest Africa, for example, which is now Namibia, used to be a German colony, and it was taken over um, by, um, by the British. Um, that is going on all um, the time. Uh, I've already, near the end, I've got to sum up, and yet I'm only halfway through my lead-off. So, um, no, I won't repeat what I've already said. Um, that's a good way to start, isn't it? Um, Yes. Um, I, I would suggest the comrades, if they haven't read Imperialism by Lenin, they read it. If you have read it, reread it and look at the lessons that come out of it. And don't read it as if it, don't read it like a Jehovah's Witness, which is you look for the sentence that you need to prove the point and ignore, of course, a lot of other stuff that contradicts you. Um, read it to learn the method that Lenin applied not in a dogmatic way, not for the definition which is uh, the, the final and last definition 
of, a, of an understanding of a process. But the method that he used to understand imperialism then, take that method that he applied 100 years ago and apply it to today's world and look at the uh, changes that have taken place. This is the rest of my lead-off where you have all the changes that have taken place. A lot of it is uh, to do with um, the, uh, the decline of US imperialism, the, the rise of China as, um, as a power, um, and also the, um, the, the developments in China uh, itself, which I can't go into in detail here because of, um, of time. I have here the figures, for example, figures uh, such as um, the top 500 corporations on a global scale. If you look at the last 30 years, I'm not going to look in here, I'm not going to give you the exact ones, I'll, I might write it down as an article. Um, every 10 years, you look at the situation, the number of Chinese companies in the top 500 grows. The number of US companies declines. It's still a case that the US companies far outnumber the Chinese ones. But that's not the end of the story. You've got to look at a process. Which way is America going? Which way is China going? And you see this um, um, change, change of balance taking place. Um, and it has consequences also for the um, practical situation that we're in um, today. Because you couldn't understand what's happening in the Middle East if you didn't understand what has happened between the different imperialist powers. Um, you couldn't understand um, the Syrian situation without understanding what has happened to the United States um, as, a, as a power. Or what's happened to Russia, the collapse of Russia um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, an enormous collapse in its economy, but then a recovery, at least a partial recovery of, the, of, uh, of Russia, mainly based on exporting uh, oil and gas, which it has a huge quantity of, but a certain um, stabilization, let's say, of Russia as a power. And whereas earlier, if you remember earlier, whenever the Americans encroached on what was Russian inf influence, the Russians would just stay quiet and it would happen. Russia um, saw NATO getting right up to the borders of Russia. They took um, Poland and, and other countries. Then you see Russia reaffirming itself, re-stabilizing, and beginning to behave in a different way. We saw not only in Georgia where they put an end to America encro America's encroachment there, in the Ukraine they went as far as saying, right, you behave like this, I'm taking the Crimea. And the Americans, what did they do? Here's a different relationship of power. What did the Americans do? What did the Europeans do to the Russians? Naughty, naughty boy. You're not supposed to do that. And then Putin says, okay, I've got, I've got a seven-year-old kid. I know what it's like. And they say, okay, what are you going to do next? And the only logical thing next is a big slap in the face. But you can't do it because of the changed relationship of uh, children with their parents today. Um, <laughs> and the same, with imperial, the same with imperialist powers. You say that to Russians, you can't do it. And you, go, you don't back it up with a major military threat. But they've taken the Crimea. They're taking it. In eastern Ukraine, they're operating in eastern Ukraine. In Syria, the Russians went in and said, you've made a mess of it. In fact, they did. They had made a mess of it. The way Russia is behaving is a consequence of the change relationship, even in the last 10, 15 years, with Russia at least regaining a certain strength on, on a global scale, not the same as China. So understanding what imperialism is, first of all, so read Lenin, but... Also understand that it's a fluid process. There's a, there's a constant change taking place in the different levels of development of different economies. As Lenin noticed, you know, the decline of the old powers growing on a slower rate, in a certain sense becoming senile, the more rapid development of the new powers. And something similar has happened to America in relation to China. And this has consequences for world politics and for the whole global um, situation. So... It's not, just, it's not just a discussion, an interesting discussion about what Lenin said or what imperialism is or, you know, is it just an export of capital or is it investment and uh, creating new industries, etc. It's all of this, but as a process, and if we understand it, then it helps us to understand what's happening around us.
I, um, I was listening the other day to some, uh, some documentary. They quoted some, I don't know if he was a historian or an artist or something. He just noticed something. He said, there's a lot of chaos in the world. There's a lot of turmoil, you know. And that was part of his explanation of what was going on. And I thought, wow, a genius. He's, no- he's noticed that the world is in turmoil and there's chaos. But unless you understand Marxist economics, and unless you understand society from Marx's point of view, it can appear like just total chaos. Um, what's going on? There's some people who explain it. The Jehovah's Witnesses, I've got a few friends who are Jehovah's Witnesses, and they say, well, this is all predicted, you see. Not by Lenin. It was predicted in the Bible. It's the end of the world. Um, and that's how it must appear to some people. Constant wars, terrorism, bombings, etc., and they can't understand what's behind it, it must be a very frightening world if you can't see what's behind it and what's, what, why this is happening. But if you're a Marxist, you can understand what's behind it, what's driving this so-called chaos and instability, and it is the crisis of capitalism itself, and it's an unprecedented crisis. It's, it's the most serious crisis this system has been in its whole history, far worse than what happened in 1929 and 30s on a much bigger scale. Think about it. The Second World War, they called it a world war, but in reality it was a part, there was only actually a small part of the world, geographically speaking, was involved. I know the Brazilians sent 300 soldiers so they can claim they they took part. Um, But today, capitalism has truly globalized the world in a sense that every part of the world is interconnected and It is a system in deep crisis, and what is required is to overthrow it. Because there is no solution to this problem outside of removing the system itself. That's what the whole of this school is about. It's discussing theory, it's discussing what's happening in the world, it's discussing history, economics, philosophy, etc., in order to understand better the situation that we're in, the world that we're in, And not just to understand it, but to be able to explain it to other people. To the young people that we meet in the Marxist societies. The workers we meet on demonstrations when we're doing a paper sale. We've got to arm our workers with the analysis. A serious, real, concrete analysis of the world as it is and why it is. In order to explain the better, the need to change the world. That's what it's about.